Now, this, week's, this week marks the 71st anniversary of the war that broke out between the two Koreas during the Cold War era. On June 25th, 1950, North Korean troops illegally crossed the border to the south to forcefully unite the divided country under its communist regime. And to this day, the two Koreas remain in a state of war, divided by the geopolitical tension and ideologies of that time. And even before the war and in the decades following, the Korean people and their narrative have been constrained by foreign powers and their uh, foreign policies and actions even to this day, shaped by international agreements that they weren't included in. To remember the forgotten war and see how the power dynamics of that time still affect South Korea today and possibly into the future, we speak with Professor Alexis Studdin, acclaimed historian of the Korean War and East Asia, who is teaching at the University of Connecticut. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's always a pleasure to have you on and such an honor, of course. How are you today? Fine, thank you. Thank you for including me in your conversation. Oh, thank you so much again, Professor. And well, and well, South Korea over the years, it's uh, made clear that it would clearly like to um, seek peace with the North and possibly end its state of war. And for years, it's also been hoping for unification. But of course, um, South Korea doesn't have the power to really forge a peace agreement with the North on its own. Um, but then with this ongoing war, it's often said that war is a continuation of policy. So whose policy or interest do you think is this war and, uh, you know, just for this war to stay in this inconclusive state? I think that's a really excellent question because uh, you mentioned 71 years. It's 68 years since the armistice was signed. These numbers are just, you know, so many lifetimes and it doesn't make sense to those of us who were not alive, were not part of it. And I think one of the most important changes is the meaning of unification or the meaning of Korea moving forward for younger Koreans who perhaps have no memory or lived reality connection with the war and they see different possibilities for Korea moving forward. So then, as you've said, the question is, whose policy is this anymore? This is a policy that came about uh, immediately in the aftermath of the Second World War and doesn't seem to have bearing today. So I think if, if you fast forward to what's happening in Seoul this week, I think it really matters that uh, the U.S. Uh, ambassador, now, or the, excuse me, the point person on North Korea, Ambassador Sung Kim, has said, you know, the United States is ready to talk to North Korea at any time without preconditions, because calling an end to the hostilities, actually ending the Korean War, will enable a new future for Korea and Koreans. And I think that that is really what we need to focus on moving forward. Well, Professor, both before and after the war, Korea had very little control over its own fate and also its relations with other countries. And as you pointed out in your book, uh, Japan's colonization of Korea, discourse and power, Korea's voice was heard uh, in, by the international community, but systematically ignored at that time. And while the San Francisco Treaty of 1951, which excluded Korea and uh, China, is believed to have uh, strongly disadvantaged Korea's journey to really recovering its nationhood. How did this multilateral treaty come about and how did it affect Korea's voice in the world, uh, even to this day? It's a very difficult history and uh, especially now makes almost zero sense for our current reality because the peace treaty that was forged between the Allies and Japan to end the Second World War had far more to do with the post-Second World War realities that were happening in Northeast Asia, beginning with China beginning with Mao's victory over Chiang Kai-shek and then the Korean War. And so uh, a peace treaty that was supposed to address what had happened leading up to 1945 instead addressed the uh, 
communist versus so-called free world divisions at the time, and therefore didn't really pay attention to what was happening prior to 1945. So the Korean War, the war, the the war between the war within China, the civil war, were what shaped, and of course the larger global picture for the United States, which was the Soviet Union. And so the Cold War determined how Korea and China got left out of addressing the Second World War. And those realities no longer hold today as we approach the 70th anniversary of this treaty. Oh, well, for the rest of the world, the well, the Cold War period has ended, but it looks like the um, East Asian countries are getting caught up in another sort of great power competition, though this time between the United States and China. And the US, of course, has been rallying its allies and really strengthening, um, stressing the importance of um, cooperation between Seoul, Washington and Tokyo to address regional issues, namely China, of course but uh, also North Korea as well. So it looks like President Moon Jae-in has been um, heeding the, this push from Washington and making efforts to reach out to Prime Minister Suga, uh, but Tokyo doesn't seem to have been responding in kind. Uh, it doesn't seem very reluctant, um, it doesn't seem very eager to have talks or even let South Korea become a bit more active in the G7 meetings or even the Quad Initiative. So why do you think there is this reluctance in Tokyo, despite its uh, strongest ally, America's push for trilateral cooperation? Well, this really gets at the heart of the matter, and thank you. Uh, it's because the current administration in Japan is inheriting a mindset that is predicated on what historians and, and political scientists call the San Francisco Treaty System. That is to say the Cold War framework, which was always a hot war in Asia, particularly in Korea, where the war technically remains ongoing. It's always been a hot war. And Japan has benefited arguably the most from that framework and is predicated this current uh, LDP, Liberal Democratic Party's existence, is predicated on sustaining uh, a division in Korea, a divided view of China and Taiwan. And so without these divisions, the, the current administration doesn't really have a framework on which to stand as it tries to reposition itself and its future. At, and if you compound that, the, the uh, administration in Japan that has been governing now for quite some time also has necessitated its power on a North Korean threat theory. That is to say that North Korea is an existential threat to Japan. And so peace initiatives with Korea endanger that view of how to build its own legitimacy in Japan. And then if you really look to the very immediate moment, uh, the Suga administration has a very low uh, support rate, around 33%, I believe, plus the Olympics are coming up. And so everything is in question. And uh, so having a hard line against Korea is always something on which this administration or this world view in Japan can find a sure footing. Unfortunately, it is really coming at the expense of Japan trying to engage with Asia, as clearly Washington would like it to do, so it's deeply frustrating, I think, to the Biden administration, especially because the President Moon has reached out repeatedly to Japan only to be shunned by Prime Minister Suga. And well, Tokyo's rather unyielding position on its imperialist past and also its uh, push to revise the country's pacifist uh, con constitution, even against the will of its own citizens. These kind of moves have worried uh, neighboring countries in the region. And, and most recently, uh, America and the IAEA's 
backing of Japan's decision to release nuclear wastewater into the Pacific. Um, some believe that this exemplifies how the uh, special relationship between Washington and Tokyo has rather emboldened Japan's assertiveness in its neighbourhood. If this is true, then do you think there could be a greater role for America to play um, in terms of encouraging Tokyo to tone down perhaps its um, intransigence and really ease Seoul and Tokyo's tensions? It, it is deeply frustrating, uh, you know, the, the addressing the historical wrongs that happened, you know, so long ago, 80, 90 years ago, the, his, the well-known histories of, of, that occurred during the occupation, the history of forced labor, the history of uh, forced sex slavery, uh, the history of territorial occupation that the current administration in Japan would try to erase and say didn't happen just lowers Japan's stature internationally. And it is deeply unfortunate. It's not necessarily the majority view in Japan, but it is certainly the only one that is commanding the airwaves. Um, how can America address that by addressing its own role in allowing Japan to continue to sweep these histories under the rug. And I do think it's in the Biden administration's interests to say to Japan that it needs to stop uh, pretending that these crimes against humanity did not happen, that uh, these histories did not happen, and to simply own up to the past. Now, that would require the United States to take a look at the San Francisco Treaty again, which many of us have been calling on the United States to do, because without the United States recognizing its own role in creating and sustaining some of Japan's ability to sweep these histories under the rug, it remains possible for Tokyo to simply ignore international norms. Um, for these uh, highly contentious uh, historical and territorial issues to be ironed out between South Korea and Japan, of course, the two, uh, the leaders of the two countries need to sit down at some point. But until now, South Korea has taken a more emotional and victim-centered approach, while Japan has taken more of a legalistic point of view. How do you think they should really coordinate their views, or at least begin their talks on the same footing? Well, I appreciate the way you framed the question. But I guess I would ask you to think that maybe Japan is behaving or Japan's administration is behaving even more emotionally than South Korea, right? I mean, we always, we always talk about, oh, Koreans are emotional, Japanese are very rational. I, I think that by ignoring and negating and erasing history, that's an emotional position as well. It's denial, and denialism is a deeply problematic emotion, which of course triggers a response because it's so frustrating when you know certain wrongs have been committed and the wrongdoer says they have not been committed, then it produces a sort of an outburst. But Japan is being emotional by denying the history. And so I think maybe if we shifted the conversation and said that denialism is the more dangerous emotion, we might move forward. Because I think Koreans increasingly have been very balanced about this. I mean, of course, we could be purely economic and say, all right, let's look for new supply chains. Let's try to you know, rework how South Korea and Japan do business. But that doesn't really make sense because Japan and South Korean corporations have such deep-seated and important ties for the region as well as the respective countries. But I think the, the way to move forward is to change the question and say that Japan is emotional by denying and South Korea is being purely rational by being upset. Very good point, Professor. There do definitely need, uh, there does definitely need to be new ways of thinking in um, solving these very age-long sticking points. And well, 
As we began the interview with the Korean War, we'll end the interview with it too. Uh, during the recent South Korea-US summit period, President Biden gave his first Medal of Honor to a 94-year-old veteran of the Korean War. What was this moment like for you as a historian who has long studied the, uh, the Korean War, the war that has quite ironically been remembered for being forgotten? I thought that uh, President Biden's bestowing the Medal of Honor to Ralph Puckett Jr. was very important. It shows the importance that the United States places on its relationship with South Korea. To do that with President Moon Jae-in present was actually, it was quite historic insofar as this is the first foreign president that has ever been present during such a ceremony. And especially given President Moon's family history of, you know, surviving, his parents escaped uh, from the North and uh, he was raised in the wake of devastation of the Korean War. And so it was a deeply emotional moment. And to see both President Moon and President Biden on their knees next to uh, Ralph Puckett sort of to bring them down to his level to show what this history means to all the nations as well as the individuals involved, I thought was deeply meaningful and something that I wish uh, had had even larger press coverage here in the United States. Well, thank you for making this uh Making, uh, making time for our deeply meaningful discussion today. That was uh, Dr. Alexis Studden, Professor of History at the University of Connecticut. Again, thank you so much, Professor, for your time. Thank you. And to our viewers, as always, thank you very much for watching.